Yes. Here I am. Good morning, everybody. We start a little bit later because um, people were still coming in, probably still coming in, I think. I have the, my name is Heinz Soss, if you don't know me, um, and uh, I have the honor of uh, opening day three of the Nora 4 conference. And it is uh, just a, a bit of impressions for me, just a few words. Um, it's just great to witness um, uh, the past two days compared to only one year ago, we saw a great increase of activities from many different themes related to native oyster restoration, um, a broadening of the geographic scope, particularly more to the south of Europe. Um, of course, the north, northern parts are still very active and increasingly active, but also more to the south. A broadening of interested parties, such as governments being more involved. That's also good. Uh, <coughs> we still wait for a bit more financial support by governments, but uh, let's, see, let's see how that, uh, how that comes out in the next year. And of course, the immense productivity of the working groups. And uh, by the way, the site selection checklist is now available in the project and partners room. And just a personal note for me, when I started more than 10 years ago with the idea of ex active restoration of marine nature, particularly the epibenthic reefs, I received completely blank faces. I felt very alone. And, I, and you can see on me that that is emotional for me. And it's even more emotional and very positively emotional to see so many people here together, together the past few days. And these tears are real. Sorry about the hiccup, but I find it fantastic that so many people have joined us in doing something which we all think is immensely important. Now, what I also wanted to say is the uh, advisory board invited you all to express your opinions on Nora's directions and to be more involved in its operations. It was again good to experience the large number of you present and the energy in the virtual room, even at the end of a long and intense day. We will come back to this today in the second advisory board session at the end of the conference. And on the background, very hard work is still being done to present the results of the inquiry, particularly by Kuno Bonasic. Um, I hope we will be able to, to present you with a clear picture. And then today, the keynote by Chris Gillies. Well, Chris, a very special welcome and a good evening to you. It's great to have you here. And it's great about the hearing of the, uh, I think, immense Australian uh, work that is that is being done and that's going to be done. We will also have the ecosystem service session and the genetic session, all again, very important themes. And then now, without any further ado, over to Luke Helmer, the dance master of the ecosystem service session. Thank you very much, Hein, and uh, welcome everybody. Good morning, afternoon or evening, depending on where you are around the world. Um, I have the privilege of hosting and chairing the ecosystem services. This was supposed to be done with Dr. Joanne Preston as well. She sends her apologies. Hopefully she will be able to make the session for the question and answers. But I think most of you will agree that quantifying the ecosystem services is gonna be a key element for native oyster restoration in Europe. And some of the examples here today are fantastic and will hopefully start opening doors for wider opportunities with governments and potential funders and for further collaboration. So without further ado, I will introduce uh, my previous PhD supervisor and now good friend, Dr. Joanne Preston, who's gonna be giving a summary of the work that we've been doing in the Solent quantifying the biodiversity associated with oysters, native oysters, and particularly within our nursery systems. So if Max, you would kindly play her presentation. Good morning, Nora. Today, I'm going to be talking about the habitat provisioning and nursery function 
of the European Aid Oyster, which is supported by the distinct and highly biodiverse community we found associated with native oyster habitat. Um, I am representing my colleagues here today and the data that's been collected by Luke Helmer, Eric Carrascott, Fiona Woods and Ian Hendy. So there's a range of biodiversity studies we've been, done, been doing over the last um, four or five years and they're listed here. And the reason why we've been conducting these is we're interested in how biogenic habitat supports biodiversity, what the nature of this biodiversity and trophic structure is, and how this um, provides ecosystem services of particular interest is the fish provisioning and nursery function. Um, and so um, these are some of the biodiversity research questions we've also been asking. And um, this is important for a variety of reasons. We do want to need, need to understand more fully the nursery and habitat function of oxygenated species because they are so degraded. Um, their importance to commercial or conservation species um, really helps with formation of policy and driving funding forward. We also need to formulate an ecologically coherent reference ecosystem for restoration projects. It also helps us understand how utilisation of these habitats by mobile species goes across the seascape and it helps provide the data underpinning the quantification of fish and mobile invertebrate biomass for quantifying provisioning services. So in the Solent, um, the ecological niche left open by overfishing of Austria edulis has been occupied by the Pridula fornicata as um, presented by Luke earlier in the week. And when we looked at the biodiversity associated with both um, slip limpet substrate and oyster substrate, we found that the biodiversity represented by the distribution of this principal component um, ordination in, in the bottom corner here, the species community was completely different um, associated with oyster substrate versus limpet substrates. And it also, was also significantly less um, biodiverse in terms of number of species and total abundant. So we here see here that pigeon fauna carta, although has a functional equivalence in terms of filtration rate, it is not an equivalent ecosystem engineer because the presence drives ecological phase shift by competitive larval exclusion and changes to the benthos and the associated community. This is um, summed up in our, our paper from the last NORA special edition. Now, um, when we started in the solar, again presented from um, Luke earlier, we deployed these oyster cages um, across the whole region. This is the UK, this is Solent, um, from oysters fished from the harbour. And we want to understand the biodiversity associated with these as part of the ongoing monitoring. And these cages were suspended under marinas at a variety of locations. And what we found, um, this is the total abundance of epibiont species um, across the different locations. Um, we found a high biodiversity, um, higher than we first um, thought, and um, a whole range of epibiont species um, were identified. The community at um, Saxon Wolf was different, and this was driven by a lower salinity than all the other sites, at least uh, four parts per mil, and uh, a minimum of 13.2, and the others were mostly fully marine. When we looked at the, um, the solitary organisms associated on the oysters, again, um, we found a high biodiversity across all sites, but the Saxon Wharf community had a different species composition driven, we think, by the salinity gradient. Um, Langston Harbour, UP, had the highest species richness, and BA in Portsmouth Harbour had the lowest. These are actually connected harbours, but have a pollution gradient. Overall, there are 130 species and more than 11 phyla, and there was no difference between the oysters or replicates within location within the species composition. So we saw a high epibiont biodiversity, and then we looked at the mobile cage fauna and uh, method, methods for this have been presented previously. Um, and we found, um, first of all, a common community across all sites with the um, um, commonly occurring was the European eel, um, the uh, um, green shore crab, the common shrimp, and um, we also found the velvet swimming crab um, appearing in most of the sites. But we saw a whole range of chordates. So we've got the um, 15 spine stickleback there, the long crawl porcelain crab, crab, we've got the common blenny, um, cork wing wrasse, we've got the um, long slender seahorse, sea spiders, the European eel, common shrimp, 
um, common crab, shore crab, um, swimming crab. Um, we have the squat lobster, we have the tompot blenny, various spider crabs, um, um, Rousseau's crab, crab um, little pea crab there, and juvenile European sea bass. So we had a really rich mobile farm for the community associated across these cages. When we looked at the trophic gilts, um, even though previously Saxonmore had a different species community, the tro trophic gilts present were consistent across the locations across the serpent. And so we see here that um, the Austroedulus not only supports a highly diverse community, but one with a fairly consistent trophic structure, including all the different trophic gills. We found that um, filter feeders contributed um, over 50% of the community and then strongly um, a high presence of both omnivores between 10 and 20% and carnivores were between five and 6%. And European eels kept on popping up. So we see a variation in species composition driven by physiochemical environmental factors, but the trophic structure and functional groups remained highly consistent. There is a whole uh, abundance of epigrant and macrofaunal species which provide um, food prey species for commercially important fish, such as um, the sea bass and um, possibly the European eel. It also appears that the broodstock cage provide habitat and refugia for this um, endangered, critically endangered species. The size class of the bass and the eels um, support a nursery function, and it, it appears that it is a habitat and foraging ground for the long for the protected long sounded seahorse. So as well as um, allowing us to understand more fully the biodiversity associated with this oyster, it seems these cages can act as intermediate refugia, habitat or foraging grounds for mobile species in fragmented or degraded coastal systems. And uh, um, this has been now rolled out in the Wild Oysters Project that um, is going across the UK. And here is uh, one of the uh, videos of the eel that um, Luke took when it jumped out of the cage and surprised him. So the next question was really, um, okay, you're getting all this biodiversity, but it's just because the cage is actually has an artificial reef. So we decided to test this by um, looking at empty cages, micro reef cages, and those with oysters in it, um, with three replicates in different positions. Um, and we're just looking at mobile fauna. Um, there's a lovely little nudie rank that we found um, lurking in one of the cages. And we started this in 2020 and had data for weeks one and four, and then COVID came along and, and stopped our fun. We managed to get to weeks 24 and 37 in between. So we've got a whole new data set, but um, still what we see is biodiversity is driven by the biogenic species, not the three-dimensional complexity. The majority of the macrofaunal biodiversity is associated with live oil oyster substrate, and 55% of the macrofaunal um, species is associated with oysters, not the reef or the empty cages. And we saw the diversity, both the abundance of species richness was significantly more diverse in the oyster cages than the micro reef or empty cages. And these are the most 25 abundant family, families across the three different types of cages. Um, and this was supported significantly um, different and higher um, after week 24 and 37 as the cages reach their climax community. So as well as being significantly more biodiverse, um, the oysters also supported a distinct species community that was um, significantly distinct from the cages with either nothing in them, the empty cages or the micro reefs. Um, and the chordates were only present in the oyster cages, and um, the common shrimp, polychaetes, and four species of crabs accounted for 74% of similarity across the cages with oysters in them. And there's a common belief to cheer everyone up. So we see that it is the biogenic Austria edulis habitats that's driving both the higher biodiversity and the species um, community and trophic structure. We can see that um, when you look to the mobility gradients of fauna recruiting to these cages, um, A is the empty cages, B are the micro reef cages, and C are the oyster reefs, that you get a more trophic, um, trophically complex colonization of um, faunal species to the cages earlier. And we, we split them up into highly mobile, mobile, mobile slow moving sessile. 
So because um, COVID stopped play, we um, did uh, the data review and looked at the literature to find all the different species associated with Australopithecus as published. And um, what we did, we created a presence absence database from these, checked the species against the um, worms and uh, ranked them um, taxonomically and into trophic gills. The papers we used um, go from 1954, Coringas, to 2018-19, the data collected from Solent, and is mostly published data, but also includes a PhD thesis. What we found that the um, species were unequally distributed across the sites was some things that could be more diverse than others, such as Bally Henry in Northern Ireland. The lowest diversity was also found in Northern Ireland in Loch Foyle, supporting our hypothesis that local conditions can drive um, biodiversity and species composition. Across the site, across all the sites across Europe, um, Crustacea were the most abundant phyla, followed by Cordata, Cordata, the Cordate, and the Mollusca. Again, reflecting the patterns we've been seeing in the regional studies of the Solent. Um, we also found a similar, a high trophic complexity. All seven gills were represented by species of, observed across all sites. And the species were not distributed equally across the trophic gills, with significantly more species in the suspension feeders and the carnivores. A total of 172 suspension feeders and 152 species of carnivore. And again, a, a apart from the Adriatic, there's a consistent or very similar trophic structure across the sites. When we looked again at the um, the number of species within the trophic gills, you can see a dominance of carnivores, omnivores, and suspension feeders, both active and passive. And there's emerging evidence here for a tight predator prey links between um, fish prey species and the um, fish species inhabiting the oyster um, habitat. Um, so it appears from this evidence that oyster habitat supports community of fish prey species and this is the mechanism by which it supports, as well as habitat and refugia, the higher biodiversity of fish species. So to conclude, um, native oyster habitat are biodiversity hotspots, providing refugia for critically endangered um, and species of conservation importance. It is the biogenic component, not the three-dimensional complexity, that is driving this trophic complexity and structure and higher biodiversity. Although we see environmental factors can drive local patterns in species community composition. This trophic structure is complex and consistent across large biogeographic scales and filter or suspension feeders and carnivore omnivores dominate the trophic structure. So oysters are providing habitat and foraging grounds for fish and large crustaceans and there's an emerging evidence for this tight link between um, fish prey species and uh, we can need to build on the evidence to link um, this um, with fish biomass and reef dependent prey species. So this is important um, to build on this evidence base um, for development of biodiversity and fishery related policy in the future and to establish the ecologically representative baselines for target reference ecosystems. And finally, um, open call if you'd like to collaborate to expand the biodiversity data set. Um, I'd be really keen to um, do so and, uh, and with a focus on fish provisioning and nursery habitat function. And as we've seen for several of these um, talks through Nora, there's emerging interest for looking at this in association with Angela and Gila. Um, huge thank you to you all for listening um, and uh, an even bigger thank you to all the amazing people who I work with to generate this data. Thank you. So as I mentioned earlier, unfortunately, Jo isn't with us at the moment, but she will hopefully be here for the question and answer session, or I will be able to answer any questions that are directed at that presentation. Uh, moving swiftly on, we're gonna move on to, uh, move from the surface from our nursery system down to the seabed. And uh, our next presentation is uh, Naomi Cannon, a PhD student at Harriet Watt University. Her research is focusing on the relationship between biogenic restructure and biodiversity. And she's worked as part of the DEEP project team since 2018 as a scientific diver and a researcher. So over to you. Okay, let me just share my screen. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, so hello everyone. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about understanding biodiversity restoration using sustainable rotational fishery management. Uh, this work was done with thanks to Deep, Glenn Morangi, Perry Ort University, the Loch Ryan Oyster Fishery and the Marine Conservation Society. So oyster restoration is increasingly being included as a priority in many coastal conservation initiatives. And there are many locations around Europe and the UK which have had historical oyster fisheries, as well as remnant populations that are now being considered as possible sites for native oyster restoration. Is therefore essential that we um, understand the consequences of such restoration activities. But due to the decline of native oysters as a habitat, it's difficult to visualize what a healthy reef would look like or has looked like in the past in terms of biodiversity. Thus, it's vital that we gain an ecological understanding of the oyster reef and establish the relationship between the reef and its associated biotic community. Uh, the aim of the study was to understand the relationship between the density of live and dead Austria edulis shell and the biodiversity of its associated mobile macrofaunal community, and to use this relationship to develop a predictive model. With the outlook of enabling restoration practitioners and their funders to predict and monitor the benefits of their restoration activities. Uh, we broke this down into two hypotheses. Uh, number one, the macrofaunal biodiversity of an oyster reef community is affected by the density of oyster shell. And two, the length of time since fishing disturbance influences the recovery of biodiversity um, of the oyster reef. Uh, this study was carried out in Loch Ryan, which contains one of the last natural oyster fisheries in Scotland. The family owned oyster fishery has been running since 1701 and uses a six year rotational harvest system. This means that after an area has been harvested, it will not be touched again for at least six years. And this has provided us with a great opportunity for an experimental setup that allows us to look at oyster reef recovery over a six year timeline simultaneously. And this is used as an analog for oyster reef restoration progress. So we selected three treatment plots, uh, which had been harvested by the fishery one year before, two years before, and six years before. Each plot was surveyed using scuba divers with full replicates. Uh, to record macrofaunal biodiversity, um, video was taken along the transects, and that was later analysed to identify and count mobile macrofaunal species, specifically crabs, echinoderms, and demersal fish. Um, we took quadrats at random intervals along each of the uh, each of the transects to estimate shell density. Uh, these images are taken from uh, treatment plot one, so the one that had been harvested one year before. The top image is a screen grab from the video transect, and the bottom is one of the photo quadrats. Uh, here are the images from treatment two, so the one that had been harvested two years before and uh, treatment three, which had been harvested six years before. So as you can see here, there is already a clear difference in oyster density and in biodiversity. And we observed 27 macrofaunal species across the three treatment sites. Biodiversity indices were found to be significant across the sites. Indeed, Shannon Wiener's diversity index was 40% higher in the six year plot than in the one year old plot. Uh, Margulath's richness was also significant, but Pilu's evenness was not. Um, we also found oyster shell density to be significant across the sites. By comparing Shannon Wiener's diversity, which is the most significant indice, against oyster shell density, we found a strong logarithmic relationship, as you can see in the graph on the screen. And these trends are what we would expect from the six year rotational harvest system used by the fishery. And the increased biodiversity is most likely due to an increase in the structural complexity created by the matrix of live and dead oyster shell. 
uh, by plotting Shannon's against Yearson's disturbance in a logarithmic regression model, we can project the biodiversity values we could expect if the oyster reef was left undisturbed for a longer period of time. Uh, this suggests that it could potentially take a minimum of 10 years for full biodiversity recovery. Now, the findings from the study show a unique example from a long-term dredge study that has enabled the survival of a rare oyster habitat and its biotic community. We've shown that there is a strong relationship between the reef structure and its associated faunal community. Uh, this work can be used to gauge the progress of restoration projects, both in terms of the increase in shell material and implied simultaneous increase in biodiversity. Also indicates that recovery is decadal in scale. And so long as restoration is not recruitment limited, we would expect biodiversity and restoration sites to behave in a very similar way. Um, and thank you for listening to me today. Um, I'm sorry I went through that a little bit quickly, but I'm very much looking forward to answering any questions. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much, Naomi. That was a really interesting talk with uh, some fantastic images there pointed out by Feline as well. Uh, moving swiftly on in the interest of time, and we'll save all the questions for the end. Our next presentation, a slight change to the uh, online um, program, a uh, slightly different presenter. We've got Akinima Macaniola or Max, who is a graduate student of the Erasmus Mundus Masters in Marine Environmental Resources. For the fulfillment of his master's, he carried out his thesis at the Institute Espanol de Oceanografia in Mercia in the framework of the Mar Menon project. So over to you. Good day, everyone. My name is Akinima Macaniola. I will be giving a presentation entitled Scope for Growth of Marmeno Flat Oysters Under Eutropic Conditions Implication for Future Bioremediation Action. Firstly, I would like to uh, talk about the uh, Marmeno. The Marmeno is on the Mediterranean shore of Spain uh, with an area of 135 kilometers square. It is a shallow uh, lagoon with maximum depth of six meters and the water during the summer can rise up to 33 degrees Celsius, and during the winter, it could be as low as 9 degrees Celsius. The salinity ranges between 42 to 48 uh, ppt, and the water resident time is one year. However, the lagoon is protected by several environmental laws, and it also serves as home for different marine organisms, such, uh, such as fishes, um, a giant clam, also referred to as Pina nobilis and European flat oyster. However, several changes have drastically affected the area of the Mameno, including a change in the cultivation uh, method, which uses greater amounts of water and fertilization and uh, fertilizer of nitrogen and phosphorus of uh, origin. Also, the construction of the uh, extension channel, which opened up the Mameno to the Mediterranean. Dredging activities is also one of the major threats of the Mameno, and also the development of the urban area to accommodate more tourism. After a decade of human uh, in, uh, impact in the area, the first uh, phytoplankton bloom was experienced in 2015, and more follow after then, even up to uh, this year. And this has caused uh, anoxia mass anoxia mass mortality in the Mameno. This experiment was designed uh, as a result of the uh, particulate organic matter that was uh, recorded in the Mameno. The graph here uh, shows the evolution of particulate organic uh, organic matter in the Mameno carried out by the monitoring team of the uh, Spanish Institute of Oceanography when the first eutropic uh, condition was experienced. The range of particulate matter observed in the Mameno uh, during the phytoplasm bloom was replicated in this experiment, and which we refer to as simulation uh, one 
simulation two, simulation theory, they were carried out in the lab. Simulation one is uh, 0 0.8 milligram per liter, which is the uh, normal uh, particulate organic matter level. The uh, simulation two is uh, 2.5 milligram per liter, which is uh, the uh, the medium, uh, medium concentration. And the highest concentration is we regard it as the simulation three, which is uh, 4.8 uh, milligram per liter of uh, particulate organic uh, uh, organic matter. The uh, materials and method. This experiment was carried out to know the response of oysters to different concentration of the microalgae in and its implication for clearing the excessive nutrients in the in the lagoon. The oysters were individually placed in a flow through system and uh, 12 experimental chambers of four liters each were used and 10 staff for the uh, experimentation of 10 individuals and two chambers was used as uh, control. The, the experiment was carried out under a controlled atmosphere with a uh, temperature of uh, 18 degrees uh, Celsius. The salinity ranges between uh, 40 to 42 uh, ppt, and uh, the average weight of the of the uh, oysters was 198. And each experiment, uh, experimental simulation was run for five days, whereby the oysters were allowed to acclimatize to the experimental condition on the first day, and the reading were taken for the following four days. And the parameters that were measured are the clearance rate, the injection rate, the absorption efficiency, absorption rate, metabolic rate, and scope for growth. Now I would like to talk about the result of the experiment and explain accordingly. From, uh, from these graphs, we realize uh, after the experiment, we realized that the oysters were of two categories. The oyster found in the mamino, once they are one, they are fast feeders, which we refer to as high feeders, and the other category are low feeders. The high feeders will represent them as A, the low feeders will represent them uh, as B. So uh, for the clearance rates, the the clearance rates re uh, decrease with increase in food uh, concentration. Uh, for the high feeding oysters, why it remained constant in the uh, low feeders. And the clearance rate of the high feeding oysters is three times higher why compared to the low feeding oysters. The injection, the injection rate. This is the intake of organic uh, matter and was which was calculated. The injection rate of the uh, high feeding oysters increase with increase in uh, the food concentration. Uh, but at the at the uh, second simulation, it got to a maximum where the uh, there was a stability in the injection rate of the oysters. So definitely a further increase in concentration does not have impact in the rate at which the oyster ingests particulate organic matter. Whereas in the uh, low feeding oysters, the an increase in the concentration also cause increase in the injection rate. The absorption efficiency. The absorption efficiency of the, uh, of the oysters were constant because there was, not, there was no increase in the absorption uh, efficiency regardless of increase in the particulate organic matter. The absorption efficiency of the uh, high feeding oysters were 64 percent while the low feeding oyster were 60 percent the absorption rate the absorption rate followed the same trend as the injection rate there is increase in uh, the absorption rate with increase in the particulate uh, organic matter concentration for both high feeding oysters and low feeding oysters whereas the oysters the high feeding oysters uh, achieve a maximum absorption rate at the medium particulate, uh, at the medium uh, simulation, the medium concentration. Uh, now I will talk about the uh, metabolic rate. 
this is the rate at which uh, oxygen is being consumed by the oysters. And this, for the hydrogen oysters, the rate at which they consume oxygen is lower, why compared to the, uh, the low feeding uh, oysters? The, the low feeding oyster have metabolic rate of uh, 1.2 milligram of oxygen, while the high feeding oyster has 0.8 milligram of oxygen. And now the scope for growth. The scope for growth is the energy available for growth by the oysters. The oysters are the high feeding oyster show higher energy available for growth. Why uh, compared to the uh, low feeding uh, oysters? Increase in concentration of the uh, high feeding oysters uh, above 2.5 milligram per liter does not necessarily increase the scope of growth of the high feeding oysters. So whereas the low feeding oysters uh, have a constant increase uh, as, as a as progressive increase in the scope for growth, but the, the value is three times lesser. Why? When compared to the scope of growth of the high feeding oysters. The conclusion of this experiment, there are two category of oysters present in the Mamenon, the uh, fast feeding oysters and the low feeding oysters, which we also refer to as the, the high feeders and, and low feeders. And also the high feeding oysters were able to attain a clearance rate, which is three times higher while compared to the ones registered in the low feeding oysters. The oysters achieved the maximum capacity of particle co-absorption at the uh, medium concentration, which is the second uh, simulation. And the metabolic cost of the low feeding oysters were higher when compared to the high feeding oysters. And summarily, clearance rate should be used as a method to select oysters to be used for brute stock or restoration activities and for sure bowel remediation. Thank you all for listening. And thank you to all of the presenters for not only fantastic presentations, but also keeping us to time as well. I shall now pass over to Bose Hancock, and I believe we're going to flip to the other side of the planet for uh, what I'm hoping and expect to be a really interesting talk on some of the work going on down under. Thanks very much, Luke. Yes, we're, we're heading, heading down under. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Chris Gillies from Australia. Um, somebody I've known for a number of years and someone who likes to, to pack a lot into his time from you know, PhD in the Antarctic diving under the ice cap down there to leading marine conservation in Australia. There's been no moss growing under his feet. Um, Chris has worked across a pretty broad spectrum of the marine conservation portfolios. He's been an ecologist with state and federal agencies. He's um, he's been the science director of Earthwatch Australia and um, has built a vision for marine conservation and restoration for, for TNC um, and for, for Australia. Um, one of the, the things that is perhaps not going to be highlighted by Chris is that he's a real team builder. Um, he has established a pretty incredible team in Australia to execute on the vision that he's creating as he moves on to, to broaden out the scope um, of the work that he's undertaking. So um, there's, there's a real kind of movement um, being left in Chris's wake as he, as he moves through. So as you listen to um, Chris speak this morning, remember that in 2014, Australia didn't have, or TNC Australia didn't have a marine program at all. And Australia basically didn't have a marine restoration program. Um, so the time that period that Chris is describing here has seen the development of both of those um, throughout Australia. So with that, and, and no, no pressure, Chris, um, I'll hand over to you. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Bose, for that very generous uh, introduction. And you have uh, also played no small part uh, in all this fantastic work that uh, I'm about to present. 
Oh, hello, everyone, and, and thank you so much for inviting me here um, today. I'm really excited um, to be presenting and providing you this opportunity to talk a little bit about some of the work that we're doing in Australia. Uh, I'm dialing in from Melbourne, which is Wurundjeri country, and I'd just like to uh, start this um, talk by acknowledging the Wurundjeri as the traditional custodians of the land on which uh, I'm speaking to you on today and uh, pass on my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Now, um, the connection between Europe, uh, Australia, uh, via an oyster, um, it goes a little bit further back than this conference, and it goes a little bit further back uh, than our Oceans Program, which we kickstarted, both mentioned back in 2014. Uh, and in fact, it goes way back into really the, the real roots of the, at least the European roots of Australia. Thanks. Next slide there. Uh, so we can start off with, uh, sorry, next slide. Thanks. Brent. Okay, so uh, this guy here, this is George Vancouver. Uh, and he, you might recall uh, or remember from his name, that he's uh, one of the many English explorers that uh, explored uh, the Australian waters and gave his last name to, of course, the city of Vancouver up in North America. And uh, he was responsible for exploring the southwest portion of Australia. Next slide, thanks. Uh, and right down below uh, Perth, if you know where that is. And he called Oyster Harbour, um, as he records in his diary, because he sent his men ashore on a longboat to fetch uh, wood and water, and they landed on top of a reef. Now, it wasn't any old reef. It was a reef made up of millions and millions of oysters. So he did what uh, any sane person would do of the day. Uh, they stopped, they lit a fire, and they feasted sumptuously on oysters uh, for the rest of the afternoon. If you go there today in that top right hand corner, you don't see any evidence of oysters in Oyster Harbour apart from uh, the aquaculture. Uh, but if you dig your hand down into the sediment, you can pull out these old, uh, old oyster shells, these flat oyster shells uh, right throughout the bay. Next slide, thanks. Uh, and if uh, George Vancouver was not the only um, uh, early explorer, of course, we had Matthew Flinders who recorded this in his diary. We had uh, Baudin, uh, La Perouse, uh, there are Dutch explorers. There are many, uh, many of our first European settlers recorded this uh, amazing abundance of oysters um, right throughout Australia. Next slide. And so it got us thinking uh, that, you know, how many places around Australia uh, were actually called Oyster Harbour or Oyster Bay? And it turns out that there's quite a few, right? At least 60 odd locations were called Oyster Harbour. And we thought, well, most explorers are probably not going to name uh, an inconspicuous, you know, a location based on some inconspicuous little bivalve. They're probably going to name it after some genuine uh, physical feature in the landscape. So it really got us thinking uh, a little bit more about, okay, well, maybe there has been a significant history of oyster reefs in Australia. Next, please. Uh, and of course, uh, our uh, early um, European forefathers are not the only ones to recognise the presence of oysters in the landscape. There's a long and rich history of our First Nations uh, harvesting and managing oyster reefs uh, for consumption and cultural purposes. And this is just a small map uh, of Tasmania down in southern Australia that corresponds to the number of these shell middens, these old um, shell rubbish heaps, and the amount of oyster shells uh, in those which of course now correspond to where we um, largely have oyster aquaculture and on some of those locality names as well. Thanks. Next slide, thanks. Uh, so as Bose um, mentioned, back in 2014, we kickstarted our oceans program. Uh, we were very envious of the work that was happening in the US and uh, TNC wanted to put um, all of that uh, experience to good use in Australia and really look to accelerate large scale restoration and really ecosystem wide restoration, what we're talking about uh, now in Australia. And we chose shellfish reefs as that ecosystem that we could um, commence that work with. And I'm really excited uh, that we're now starting to venture outside of reefs uh, and starting to focus on some of our kelp reefs as well. Um, but the genesis of that strategy really had five core elements. It was to understand how much we had lost, protect what's uh, remaining, uh, it certainly invest in the science in a strategic sense, as well as policy and, and grow the pot of funding. And of course, uh, demonstrate how we could undertake these large scale restoration projects. Next. Uh, Bo's mentioned, um, when we first started in 2014, there were only six scientific papers that had mentioned oyster reefs uh, in any detail in Australia. There were no distribution maps, ecological descriptions, no ecosystem service maps, 
uh, essentially zero funding allocated, no government uh, had it registered as an ecosystem or spoke about them in monitoring reports of uh, estuary uh, ecosystems. And there were certainly no efforts to protect or restore shellfish ecosystems. And really the only good news story about this is uh, when you're trying to track progress against a baseline starting from zero makes life really easy. So um, we've had a really good time of, of being able to track our progress against essentially you know, this, um, this very low baseline. Thanks. So what we first did uh, was we went out and began to um, dive into the history. We, we looked at uh, newspaper reports, we looked at um, old fisheries records, beginning to pick out these little snippets of stories around human use uh, at that sort of provided knowledge around density of oysters uh, through fisheries and local descriptions. We started to build up this bank of stories and narratives out of, um, out of these newspaper reports. Uh, but importantly, we began to also look at uh, the basis for quantifying the decline. We we're able to use some of that information to engage some of our key stakeholders, which are recreational fishers in Australia and the aquaculture sector. And they also began to give us an understanding of where we might look to start to uh, restore these ecosystems in a forward looking uh, sense. Um, I won't go through all the science uh, today, but uh, in that very short period of time, we now have published over 50 scientific publications on shellfish reefs, and we have 14 universities, which I'm really pleased, and most of those have many honours and PhD students now working on shellfish reefs. So it's been a very rapid um, rise, uh, and I'd say that shellfish reefs are now on par with many of our other uh, coastal ecosystems in terms of the attention that they're getting from the, the research community. Next slide, thanks. Uh, we also found out that we have more than just uh, two reef building or, or ecosystem building species. We have, of course, the uh, flat oyster, um, Austria angazi, which is very similar to your oyster, uh, and the rock oyster, which is very similar to Virginica, the US oyster. But we have a couple of other amazing uh, habitat building species as well. The top right hand one there, the leaf oyster, is in particular um, having a lot of interest at the moment. It's a tropical oyster species, which we knew absolutely nothing about in terms of its habitat forming abilities. Uh, but now we've since found many uh, large beds uh, and these beds form you know, fantastic sort of consolidated structures and otherwise very muddy and silty um, banks. So there's a lot of effort looking at how we might be able to use these as nature-based solutions um, in some of our tropical areas as well. Um, blue mussel reefs, we've also found that we have some beds and we're starting to use blue mussels uh, in association with our flat oysters as well. Next slide. Um, when we pulled together these snippets of information, we began to find that in Australia, we have this great oyster rush and it, it really did service the growing colonies that, um, as Australia was colonised um, by Europeans in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Naturally, you already knew about oysters and you knew what to do with them uh, as, as Australia was being colonised. And uh, we were able to understand, as I said, some of the, the information there around how big these fisheries were. And from that, we could derive, well, exactly, you know, how many oysters were they pulling out and work backwards from there and look at some of the calculations and say, well, how many oysters were, um, were there and what sort of size and physical shape some of these reefs may have been. So I won't go through all those numbers, but essentially we were able to piece together um, a lot of that early history in terms of the, the size of the fisheries back in the late 1800s. Next slide, thanks. We were also really lucky that uh, we had another Englishman, William Savile Kent. He was the inspector of fisheries in a number of different, uh, a number of different states uh, throughout Australia. And he was really the only person that tracked uh, the, and lamented the loss of shellfish reefs uh, in the late 1800s. And he recorded it in parliamentary reports. He actually trialled a lot of the French aquaculture methods in the late 1800s uh, as well. Unfortunately, all of those failed, but if it wasn't for our for uh, William Savile Kent, then we wouldn't know much at all about our historical uh, oyster reef ecosystem. So a uh, uh, tip of the hat to, uh, to William here as well. Next slide, thanks. Uh, we also had pictures like these, really rare, but we were able to uncover a couple of those. This is a rock oyster reef uh, in Queensland. This is again, just shows the extent. Uh, we certainly don't have reefs like this uh, in Australia anymore. And you can just make out a grainy image in the, in the top left-hand corner of somebody who was you know, harvesting those reefs as part of the commercial fishing and now popping them into sacks. Next slide, thanks. Uh, we had back in the late 1800s way more oyster saloons and oyster restaurants than what we have today and oyster bars. 
And again, it's just another sign that um, we had a very vibrant fisheries for oysters uh, that most Australians uh, don't know and still don't know that in fact, it was really our largest uh, fishery, larger than our fin fish fishery in the early, uh, sorry, in the late 1800s. Next slide. Uh, and I'll rush through this one as well uh, in that, um, again, we are able to find evidence through buildings that, um, and certainly those uh, lime kilns that the oyster shells were mined and certainly some of those Aboriginal middens were mined for lime and for mortar in some of our buildings as well. Next slide, thanks. Uh, we were very lucky uh, to have had great historical ecologists like Ruth Thurston, and if you're on the call today, Ruth, hello, uh, as well as Heidi Alloway, who were able to pull together all of that knowledge out of those parliamentary reports and, and fishing reports into a good scientific paper to help really inform and understand how much we've lost, uh, as well as where we are starting to uh, focus some of our restoration efforts in. So it's great that we were able to move from some of that qualitative grey literature into the, uh, the more current scientific literature as well. Thank you. Uh, we also uh, didn't forget that at the same time that it was doing this, recognizing how important, hi Ruth, <laughs> how important uh, it was to focus on the ecosystem services and why we need to restore these, uh, these uh, ecosystems. And this slide we've used you know, hundreds of times in many presentations to politicians, et cetera. And people tend to get it. You know, one hectare does a lot for us. Uh, and it is sort of these captivating uh, images and of course the experiments that, that I'm sure you will do as well on the left hand side just to demonstrate the power of um, the ecosystem service of our reefs as well. Next slide, thanks. Uh, and so, um, you know, we have a now a diversity of science and, and reports. We're very lucky to um, be involved in some of the, um, the standards uh, as well. Um, and the IUCN Red List of Ecosystems. So we really started off very early days just capturing whatever knowledge we knew in a prototyping type sense, and then built on that knowledge over the last sort of seven years as we dive, were able to dive um, deeper into that knowledge and build on, uh, build on the base. So you'll probably track that in some of the early papers, you know, we pulled together whatever we could, and then now we, you see that we have far more comprehensive science happening in Australia when we really sunk our teeth into, into this work. Next slide, thanks. Uh, we, of course, also created a shellfish network, the Australian Shellfish Reef Restoration Network. We have a conference every two years. Bose was part of the first one. It was 20 people in a room at uh, Melbourne Airport. And, and since then, we've now uh, expanded out to Asia Pacific, including New Zealand. And we have well over 200 members as well. So I encourage you to all sign up to our network and hear the latest news of what's happening in Australia and across the region too. Next slide. Uh, so all of that knowledge uh, really um, settled us down in terms of exactly how much we've lost or pretty close to. And we know that for our flat oyster reefs, we only have one uh, location still to this day that we can find of a reef of significant size. For our rock oyster ecosystems, we really only have about nine sites uh, out of 200 each um, for those. So we've been able to, next slide, thanks, um, pull that into a pretty comprehensive red list of ecosystems assessment both of those ecosystems are classified as critically endangered. And we now have our federal government uh, agency looking to list shellfish reef ecosystems as a threatened ecological community under our federal environmental legislation. And we expect that to go through fairly smoothly based on conversations that we've had recently. Uh, and that would only be the third marine ecosystem that has been listed under Australian legislation. Importantly, we also um, looked at that and we went, well, you know, that's a pretty good framework for thinking through a strategy for how we might want to restore uh, ecosystems uh, as well. So we flipped the, um, the red list of ecosystems essentially on its head and we looked at category A uh, and we thought that, you know, in terms of the extent, looking at what we would need to do to move um, the ecosystem from critically endangered down through to vulnerable. Uh, and so that was about 30% recovery of the ecosystem, which for us equated to about 60 sites. Uh, and that strategy is more or less stuck. Um, most people uh, sort of approve of that. And so we have a target now to restore 60 sites around the country, uh, roughly about five hectares as a sort of sustainable size um, per reef. Uh, and we have a number of groups, including TNC working towards that objective. And I'll move into that area now. Next slide, thanks. Uh, quick couple of key le lessons just from all of that history and science over the last seven years. We know that storytelling is really important. It's compelling for media and it's compelling for the, for the community as well. Um, I think importantly, we were able to move out of the nuance of the fishery, even though all of the science was based on oysters as a fishery, 
Um, speaking about it as an ecosystem has really helped us um, and helped government in particular get their head around a systems recovery, um, recovery rather than a fisheries base or a fish stock recovery. Uh, and it's certainly it's okay to borrow knowledge from other uh, regions. We didn't have all of that ecosystem service science. We borrowed a lot of it from uh, similar oysters and similar work in the US to help drive interest uh, into um, the Australian experience and help drive investment into uh, undertaking science in Australia for our species as well. Okay, next slide. Let's get into some of the cool uh, restoration work that we've been uh, focusing on. So in the last uh, year or so, year and a half, we were very lucky enough to get a, a pretty significant grant from the Australian government, 20 million, to restore 13 reefs uh, more or less simultaneously around the country. Uh, that proposal was very much um, geared towards a COVID relief and, and economic recovery fund. Um, we focused a lot on the jobs uh, element and before this period we'd, we'd built about six reefs and so we had some good ideas around the types of jobs that would be created um, through this work but we certainly had to um, work very hard demonstrating that environmental restoration does have an economic benefit and a direct jobs benefit and we're lucky enough to receive this funding. Uh, thanks, next slide. Um, we use maps uh, like this just to also help articulate that shellfish reef ecosystems are pretty widespread and common throughout Australia, um, certainly as widespread as uh, our other great known reef. Um, and about 10 of the 13 sites, largely around the southern uh, portion of Australia, are focused on flat oyster reefs. So we have many locations now around Australia where we have um, reef systems and work that is um, pretty similar to the work that's happening in Europe as well. Next slide, thanks. So um, the process that we follow is the, is the stand, same as um, Society of Ecological Restoration, the, the um, guidelines that have recently been released. I'll talk a little bit about suitability modeling in a moment, but we undertake that initially. We certainly do an amount of uh, community consultation that helps us narrow down into site selection. We then move through to the design and permitting phase um, into pilot reefs if we haven't built a reef there before, and then straight through to the full scale restoration. So I'll run you through our standard process that we use there. But um, one of the great things about trying to build 13 reefs right across the continent is that you um, are able to streamline your project management and project systems pretty efficiently. We've been uh, able to learn quite a lot about how we can undertake um, project rapidly. And we're starting to sort of pull it down into a, you know, almost two year period, two and a half year period to go from um, really not knowing where we would restore something in an estuary right through full scale restoration. Uh, next slide, thanks. So the important point I just wanted to make about um, restoration modeling is that it's not habitat modeling, it's restoration modeling. Uh, and that means that we focus on the logistical and the use of an estuary as much as we do around the, the ecology and the biology of the oyster. And you can pick up on some of those layers on the right hand side there where we're looking at boat ramps and you know, marine reserves, mooring zones, restricted area, public swimming areas. Um, we put all of those things in because we know they're important to the community. It's the first question all of our community groups ask. It's not about where, where does the oyster survive or where could we put um, you know, an oyster reef? It's like, how is it gonna affect me? and my use of this estuary. So um, we have a really great system now. We can pull up these um, maps within about two weeks um, of, of essentially running these models. We take these out to the community and this is what we use to um, talk about where we might start to run our pilot sites. Uh, and we find that they've really worked very well with also our, our um, permit um, our providers and policy makers too. Next slide, thanks. Uh, I could go on a whole presentation just talking about our shell recycling work. Um, we have a number of programs right around the country. They've all won um, multiple awards now, but this is where we really focus in on uh, volunteer engagement, uh, corporate engagement, as well as, um, you know, as some of our stakeholders. Uh, volunteers are involved in bagging, cleaning, shell. Um, no doubt you've seen these programs before, but they really are fantastic ways of engaging, engaging the community, engaging new audiences as well. Uh, next slide, thanks. Uh, most of our estuaries, uh, at least for flat oysters, are both recruitment and substrate limited. So we are spawning oysters um, in the hatchery. We work with about four or five hatcheries now uh, that spawn flat oysters. They do that um, uh, fairly regularly. It's not their main oyster that they um, produce, but uh, all of those hatcheries have the ability to produce oysters more or less on demand for us now. Uh, and we haven't really had a failure in an oyster in a hatchery yet. So most of the hatchery managers are pretty good at being able to spawn um, these uh, oysters in the hatchery. Next slide, thanks. Uh, 
Um, so the process is as you, as you expect, uh, we bring them up, um, we'll either shock them if they're out of, out of season and get them um, to, to release the babies. I think that little video works on the side there. If we press the button, you can see the um, juvenile oysters swimming around the hatchery. Um, we then uh, seed them on top of the colt, which I'll show you um, in a moment as well. But uh, the whole process takes about three to four weeks for um, us to really start the hatchery. Um, well, the minute we sort of put the shells in the hatchery and, and get the oysters to spawn as well. Next slide, thanks. Um, so these are small tanks. These are only, uh, so I didn't have a photo of some of our large tanks now, but um, with the amount of shell that we're producing, we certainly would have a tank, you know, probably uh, 10 times the size of what we've got there. There's some small um, test ones. We tend to have the shells in those tanks for sort of two to three weeks before we move them out into the water. Next slide, thanks. Uh, so this is what they look like on the left-hand side when they go out, although they're um, generally a little bit smaller. Um, we have tried single seed um, as well that we would get from uh, aquaculture industry or left over from the aquaculture industry. So it's near on impossible trying to measure the impact of whether these guys survive. You can imagine sprinkling those on all of our reefs. Uh, it's pretty hard to find them again once they fall into all the, all the crevices. So we certainly prefer working with the shell cult. We found that um, the flat oyster actually prefers the scallop shells probably over um, oyster shells as well. Next slide, thanks. Um, whilst they're in the, in the hatchery doing their thing there, uh, we're off bu busy building reefs. And we typically would use um, uh, you know, long arm excavators with a GPS on the tip of the bucket. Um, some of the uh, contractors have underwater form work, which is the slide on the top right hand side, where they can kind of um, you know, keep the rock more or less in a consolidated space, although we're starting to move, move away from straight lines. Um, and that we have tried sort of tipping, um, you know, rock overboard and putting them in, in uh, bins as well. But we tend to find that the excavator, at least down to uh, 10 metres or so, is, is probably our best option. Next slide as well, thanks. Uh, we we're also just starting out on assisted restoration. So um, most of our reefs we're full, fully reconstructing. We don't have um, oyster beds there that we're um, restoring. We're starting from scratch, though we do have oysters in the system. Um, this is just a picture of one location in Port Phillip Bay where we do have a semi um, you know, bed left, you could call it. There's a few oysters per square metre here. And so we're looking at just adding substrate um, and testing that as we go. We've just started that process uh, as well. Next slide, thanks. Uh, so this is kind of what our reefs will look like um, underwater. A pilot will generally be two or three of these uh, reef patches, uh, generally about 100 square metres or so in size. We're testing um, the logistics of rolling out the reefs as much as we're testing the survival of the oysters. So we try to do both in the pilot. Um, we did first start off just testing the biology on, on very small scale, a couple of square metres. We soon found out that it really didn't tell us much. We needed to um, focus on the logistics as much as the um, as much as the biology in the pilots. Next stage, no, next slide, thanks. Um, we focus on uh, heterogeneity at the site level. Uh, the top right hand um, picture there, that is Windara Reef, a 20 hectare reef. You can see that we have long uh, reefs of about 20 to 25 metres. We have medium size and small scale. They're actually in a pattern that made it really easy for the barge to move over that area without um, moving too often, uh, but we're able to get lots of different size spaces at the, at the reef um, size. The bottom uh, one there, you can see the patch. We now have lots of edge effects, recognizing that we get great, uh, greater biodiversity um, on our edges. And then when we're looking at the size of the limestone that we typically uh, are using, uh, we also look at that in terms of the interstitial spaces and having overhangs and crevices um, and you know, hidey holes, et cetera, as well. Um, so we're constantly playing with and testing um, these designs and modifying as the science is telling us more about you know, how the oysters survive in different shapes and the sorts of biodiversity that we're getting on different types of reefs. We're changing our designs as, as we're putting, um, putting more reefs in the water as well. Next slide, thanks. Um, again, a whole other presentation on monitoring evaluation. We follow uh, what, uh, what's more or less laid out in uh, best practice guidelines, um, but we certainly do focus a lot on the social economic and we're spending a, a lot of time now starting to really aggregate our data into one system and making it easy where we can compare um, from a single uh, reef, patch reef to a site right across to those 13 sites. So we're really looking forward in, in a couple of years time, the ability to be able to analyze um, all of our projects will have probably 20 reefs in the water right across the country following exactly the same methodology uh, and being able to zoom in and out all of those scales. So 
um, it's really great that we've had um, good people like Simon Reeves and Bose um, focusing on having a, a very comprehensive monitoring evaluation plan. Next slide, thanks. Uh, the last stage, of course, is of this putting the oysters uh, on top of the reefs. Um, we do that with commercial divers. We actually find that's fairly cost effective. Uh, we didn't think it would be, um, but uh, a number of quotes now have come back uh, pretty reasonable. Uh, we also use what we call a bivalve blaster, which is um, a hopper on top of a, a barge where we tip the shell and the muscle uh, down that hopper into a tube and then it blasts through water um, the oysters onto the, onto the reef and we have a commercial diver, just one diver down there, um, controlling the bottom end of the hose. So both of those methods work really well for evenly distributing um, the oyster colch over the reef. Next slide, thanks. Uh, and this is a, just a quick video I think we can play. This is just 12 months um, of a reef in South Australia. You see a bit of an oyster there. Um, and you'll get some perspective with the scale of a hand. Um, this is a recruitment that we typically would get on an oyster. Um, it's only a couple of months old. You can see the, the patches there. Um, you probably find the same thing here as well. Um, but we tend to get a lot of oyster recruitment underneath the rocks. We don't often see a lot of it on top. Uh, and then after a couple of years, we're now noticing that those oysters are growing out um, from under the rocks, on top of the rocks, and then starting to build those towers that you would um, you know, look for in, in that three-dimensional habitat. And that's consistent across both our rock oyster species and our flood oyster species as well. Uh, next slide, thanks. I'll wrap things up. I know we're pretty close to time. The other thing we're starting to notice, so our oldest reef is only five years in the water, so we're not yet at maturity, um, but we are starting to see a lot of that scungy algae that you um, typically associate the minute you put anything in the water in most marine environments starting to disappear. It's taken a while for our grazers to move in, uh, our urchins to move in, even though they're, they're very close, and other urchins, and then some of these slower colonising sponges and ascidians now, we're getting really good coverage and they're starting to outcompete the algae. So we're starting to see a real matrix of shellfish as well as other um, filter feeding um, communities onto our reefs too. Uh, and just to mention there, we also build reefs completely out of shell um, as well as limestone. So we're testing the, the differences between more of a bed type uh, habitat versus a much more rocky reef habitat as well. Next slide, thanks. So uh, second last one here, um, just to point out that when we get to the restoration uh, stage, it's ultimately about logistics and the science um, really takes a back seat. And so you need to focus a lot on those skills um, and systems in place in order to be able to make um, projects run smoothly. Um, certainly demonstrating the job benefits and measuring that really helps gain political support. And that's one of the reasons why we've been able to scale up and get so much interest. Um, predation is still a challenge in some, uh, some of our ecosystems, um, fish predation uh, predominantly. Sediment, um, we work in pretty sedimentary environments, but um, the design uh, tends to take care of that. Uh, and we're now really focusing on a lack of enabling policy. All of our legislation is focused for not putting something in the water, uh, restricting um, building, and we're trying to put something in the, in the water for good. So um, we're more or less fighting that battle with every state at the moment. Um, and my last slide for you here, um, as I'm running way out of time, second last time, second last slide, where are we at? 10% um, remaining, uh, we've got national protection more or less on the way, uh, some good science invested, um, some funding on the way, and uh, we're about you know, one third of the way across our strategy. So you know, we're doing okay for, for seven years and, and hopefully in another three or four, um, you know, we'll see us get pretty close to that 60 reef initiative. And the last one there, what are we working on? Uh, last slide, um, most of the research is now focused on multi-species and habitat restoration. So not just putting oysters back in the water, but thinking about how we can play with top down, bottom up uh, trophic forces, looking at the genetics uh, as well, um, and certainly extending a restoration to multi-ecosystem multi restoration. We're essentially lifting the model that we've built um, on oysters into giant kelp forests and, and other kelp reefs um, as well. They're very similar ecosystems in terms of the, the, the um, risks and the processes for restoration and continuing to standardise some of our monitoring evaluation reporting and nature-based solutions. It's just as big in Australia as it is elsewhere. Uh, and the last one there is certainly we're working on different ways of funding um, that work. And apologies, I haven't been able to speak much about that today, but um, nutrient trading and bonds and blended finance and aquaculture, which I think is something that we could learn for Europe as well, where, um, where we might have co-harvest occurring on reefs um, as well as conservation. So I think we're eating into the break and I will leave it there, but thank you so much. And as I mentioned at the top, um, it was just a very light touch so if there's anything in there that um, raises your interest, I'm more than happy to connect you with anyone uh, in Australia who's working on, on uh, any of those issues.
So, hello everyone. Uh, I hope the sound is clear. Uh, so my name is Pierre Boudry. Uh, I had the pleasure to uh, chair the last uh, scientific session of this Congress, which is dedicated to genetics. Everybody. Uh, my name is Omer, and this presentation is called How Many Parents Have You Got? It's about parental contribution in the flat oyster hatchery with genetic markers. And I'm a PhD student, and my three supervisors are Dr. Beckwald, Jakob Emerensen, and Camille Soren. First, a little bit about the history of the flat oyster, um, something that we consume as early as the Stone Age. Um, then the first aquaculture, or uh, what we can call aquaculture, started with the Romans one century before common era. And it's still something that we are producing in aquaculture, even though now the Pacific oyster is more prominent in terms of oyster production. And one of the key issues uh, when you want to produce oysters is to maintaining the genetic diversity because often uh, oyster production crash and we can see the genetic diversity as the raw material uh, to be able to, to sustain um, changing environmental condition or potential uh, pathogen. It's also a key issue, uh, maintaining the genetic diversity. If you want to uh, supplement a population that is depleted with some actually weird spats. But there is challenging challenges to maintain that genetic diversity in hatcheries for the, the flat oyster specifically. First of all, there's the founder effect, the fact that you are taking a, a limited uh, amount uh, of individual to make your broodstock, and which has a consequence uh, in terms of genetic drift and uh, inevitable loss of heterozygosity. There's also a huge skew sex ratio uh, in that species in the wild, where you can find as many as six male for only one female. The labile sex um, with um, a neomaphrodite system that is asynchronous, and also the low synchrony of gametogenesis. Uh, in, uh, in flat oyster hatchery, sometimes the, the females are ripe, but uh, the males are not producing any sperms and vice versa. So one good tool uh, to be able to maintain that genetic diversity is to do a retrospective uh, parental assignment, but it needs to be cost-effective, easily applicable and robust. And uh, we decided to go with 17 microsatellites microsatellite from the literature uh, so those are some genetic markers that are the gold standard to do the parental assignment. And uh, earlier attempt uh, of parental analysis for that species uh, didn't include enough markers. So uh, only four microsatellites instead of 17 for our study. Um, there was also a huge uh, null allele frequency in those in those uh, microsatellites, and it needs to be corrected. That null allele frequency it's a bias, an effect uh, that is uh, introduced by the PCR protocol uh, when you're using uh, microsatellites as genetic markers for doing your parental assignment. And also, there was a low DNA content because they used larvae, and here in this study we're going to use spats where you get more DNA out of the raw tissue. And uh, that table uh, from Lalia Seta uh, of 2010 uh, shows that uh, for one third of the offspring, uh, they couldn't be, they, they were not able to assign uh, the parental uh, pair, um, which is leaving a lot of uncertainty. And this is also the goal of that study is to really be sure, 100% sure of uh, the parental contribution. And we got three hypotheses um, to test uh, our method. First is, the first hypothesis is that large woodstock uh, should produce genetically more diverse fat than smaller broodstock. 
Um, the second hypothesis is that wild swarming events spreads uh, should also be more diverse uh, than actually swarming event spreads. And finally, that there is random mating uh, between functional and, and male and female um, in any given broodstock tank. So what we're working with, uh, we're working the, with the flat oyster coming from the Limfjorden. Uh, that's the fjord, uh, that's a fjord in, in Denmark, and that's the only place where there is still some flat oysters in, in, in the whole Denmark. Um, you got the entry in the west side of the North Sea and on the east side of the Kattegat, and uh, there's a different differential uh, level of salinity between those two seas. Then, and you get some patchy population of flat oysters um, in many places in the Limfjorden. It's also uh, a population uh, that is called uh, small but persistent. And we do have some uh, conservation uh, concern for that uh, um, flat oyster population. So where um, the broodstock uh, of our, what is the broodstock sources? Uh, in the Limfjorden um, of our tanks. Uh, first, we got that population in Luxter that uh, was used to, to build up three tank, uh, one large tank uh, with 30 oysters and two smaller tanks with six and seven oysters. And then another population, uh, a subpopulation in the Limfjorden called Nisum that uh, was used as the broodstock source for the last uh, small tank with 10 parents. And finally, uh, we collected from a spat collector a wild swarming event, or what we hypothesize as a wild swarming event, um, to make some comparison. And those uh, four tanks uh, produce five swarming events. So two swarming events for the first uh, large tank, and one swarming event each. Uh, for the smaller tanks. The first result um, on, the, on, on, on the left side is a, a pairwise FST heat map. So we are looking at the genetic di differentiation uh, between population and FST is a, an estimator of the genetic differentiation between two population. And I frame what is interesting in that graph uh, is the comparison of uh, the two uh, broodstock sources where we can see that there is no or little genetic differentiation between those two uh, population or subpopulation. There's also no genetic or little genetic differentiation between the wild swarming event and those wild population. Yeah, and FST, uh, you look at it as it's between zero and one and zero means no genetic differentiation and one means complete genetic differentiation. The table on the, on the, on the right side uh, is looking at some genetic diversity indices uh, by means of uh, the observed heterozygosity and the mean allelic richness. So on the column of the mean heterozygosity observed, uh, we don't see any change or drastic change in, in the heterozygosity level uh, between broodstocks uh, and uh, actually uh, and broodstocks and 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 real spats, but you can see the a huge decrease uh, in terms of allelic richness, richness between the broodstocks uh, and the spats produced. Second result is uh, the estimation of the relatedness between individuals of the same cohorts. So on that plot on the y-axis, you get the Relatedness uh, estimates, uh, and the estimator is Lynch and Ritlin. And on, on the x-axis, you get all the corals, and, and I'm separating uh, the three first corals, which are coming from the wild, and uh, the, the following uh, five corals that are the actually weird spats. Um, and you can see that the relatedness is increasing uh, as soon as you looking at some cords from, uh, from, from the archery. Uh, 
these core diagrams that represent all the breeding pairs for one Swami event, each rim color uh, is representing a, a potential parent. Uh, the thickness of the cord is how many uh, offspring uh, this pair produce um, proportionally to how many uh, spats we, we, we genotyped. The direction of the cord is going from the inferred dad to the inferred mother. And you can see that on those, uh, all those swarming events, we only have one mother and, and I put it in, in a bold character uh, for the label. Um, and uh, there's two things that we can say about those swarming events. First, they are not equal in how many parents are contributing uh, to the offsprings. And also uh, there's a unequal um, parentage contribution between uh, the first, uh, the second swarming event where the two dad that contributed the most to the offsprings are not the same two dad that are contributing the most to the first swarming event. So there is some overlap, but there's also a huge viability on the swarming events. Last thing that I want to say uh, is that we, we can see some sex reversion uh, on two instances. Uh, this is the first instance where the inferred mother of the first swarming event is becoming an inferred dad for the second swarming event. And the inferred mom for the second swarming event is becoming is a dad, uh, an inferred dad uh, for the first swarming event. All the things that gave each one swarming event, it's also viable um, for the first tank. Two fathers uh, contributed equally. Uh, then for the second tank, it's almost only one father that contributed the, that contributed to all the offsprings. And finally, for the last tank uh, with the put stock coming from Nisum, uh, we, we can see a more um, broad uh, contribution of more uh, inferred data that are contributing to the offsprings. Um, so a huge viability in terms of parental contribution between all the tanks. The last result is the estimation of the population effective size of all the cohorts uh, analyzed uh, for this study. And what we can see is that the estimates uh, for the wild population are really large. There's a slight decrease for the wild swarming event compared to the wild population in terms of population effective size. Uh, the large woodstock uh, don't show uh, a decrease on, in population effective size, but uh, the actually uh, real spot coming from those woodstock, uh, we can see a large decrease uh, in terms of population size in those. Uh, spat uh, cards and here we have 100% parentage assignment success which enables us to identify all the breeding pairs for each swarming event um, to get back to the hypothesis we see that larger broodstock are producing uh, more genetically diverse broods um, and smaller brood stock seems to produce broods with a reduced genetic variation, uh, but it's really viable. Second thing is that there's a strong skew in reproductive success among brood stocks. And uh, there is a variance of the degree of that skew uh, between two swarming events. We also saw uh, some sex reversion on two instances for the same brood stock at one month's interval between the two swarming events. And finally, uh, um, it seems like there is a reducing uh, um, of, of, of population effective size between uh, wild population and, and wild swarming events. Uh, but there is a drastic uh, reduction of the population size uh, between bootstock uh, and the actually real spat uh, that are produced by that bootstock. And finally, 
I think we showed that uh, this parentage assignment with 100 confidence is a useful tool to building up pedigrees uh, in archery settings and maintaining that genetic diversity. Uh, and I want to thank everybody that I'm working with, uh, Dr. Beckbold, Maybrika Kopsen, Dr. Meldrup, uh, Camille Sorel, and Jakob Emerhansen, Pascal Bao, also, and Filin, Zu, Hermansen. Thank you. Uh, and just to close the session, uh, uh, just to, to uh, re remind everyone and, and about the workshop uh, on genetics we had a few months ago, uh, you can uh, view all the talks uh, on the NORA website, they have been recorded. So if you want to hear more about genetics and uh, on different topics, uh, you're welcome to, to look at uh, these uh, recorded presentations and contact uh, the authors. And so to conclude, uh, I'll, I'll give the floor to Henning uh, to give the final words and, and close uh, the conference. Thank you, Pierre. It is for me a real honor and thank you for being invited to say the final, final words after Pierre already <laughs> opened uh, a range of things that, that should have been addressed at the end and so i i just want to to i think express all of you and feels about this conference i think to you and to me it was again an extremely interesting conference it was so inspiring to see what under this really complicated conditions uh, we could conduct but also what you could conduct in this month and years that were also difficult for scientists in the field we know that and we are aware of that and so this wealth of, of new information that that you presented to us and also this many many hopeful signs of, of progress in restoration in, in europe learning also from examples from somewhere else overseas and or state of knowledge right now has really increased tremendously to my reception and it also allows us to be bold or be bolder than we were some years ago and think even more about an engagement and implementing real restoration in the field as this is i understand still our ultimate goal of our whole initiative for for europe and for that for this next step apart from the constant science support that needs to be ongoing i think we still have to call a little more for engagement of administrators around europe and definitely, as Pierre highlighted, more financial support just to, to keep the business of NORA running, not talking about the projects in the field. This is a different issue, but we have to maintain our support among ourselves, which, which works so, so wonderful at the moment. But when we come to this point, I, I also only want to repeat the, the feeling that we, we should even be better in our cooperation with, with oyster farmers and practi practitioners in the field. And uh, this stretched out hands that we saw already in, in Edinburgh. And now again, uh, we, we really should grab each other and come to common proposals because as some of you already agreed there are quite substantial pots of money on the fishery side and on the conservation side but if we manage to show both sides that we work together and it, it is an enhancement process i'm very sure that that will be very welcome this message at least as far as i know it from from my experience in brussels the call for new 
people getting engaged in the field that Pierre already addressed. I, I really want to ad address it again. And with this high number of new participants in the meeting that we saw from Paul, I, I even feel more encouraged to, to address that people there is really interest and work to do in, in our organization. Please get on board send your interests, send a letter and show your interest. In the end of the day, what we should compile is really a, a group that is steering our NORA uh, meetings, consisting of scientists, conservation practitioners, administrators, oyster farmers, and conservation NGOs. So, so all these groups should be equally present in that uh, steering of or, or NORA, which, which is not quite the case at the moment. So this brings me to an, a, a, a job that I really like to do very much. And I like to see the screen, Max, if, if that is possible, um, showing to you who is all behind that? You have seen that, you, you know that there are a number of people, but sometimes you realize it's the names repeating and all this. But however, it is for me really a pleasure and the whole advisory board really urged me and uh, I do that on behalf of the advisory board, what I say now, we want to thank very, very much the organizing uh, committee for the NORA conference and the secretariat, which are to a large degree the same persons. Uh, I would like to highlight Feline, Katrin, Bose, Hein, and Carol. They all did in their capacities. They have perfect job. I, I really enjoyed to have this conference with you and I think we all shared the view. It, it ran so, so marvelously uh, uh, smoothly that, that um, well, one, one can't do better, I, I guess. At the same time, we want to thank Andreas Essensberger, the person who works behind the scene, who, who runs the website in such a perfect manner, again, which I hardly saw in other organizations with many more years of existence and much more money in the background. The technical support of our meeting, Max, this was also perfect. It's not much I can say to that. Thank you for this. And those people who work in the scientific committee you see listed here and in the advisory board, many of them you, you got to learn during this meeting. I think I can speak on behalf of them. We, we just joy, enjoy to be with you in this NORA community. But with all these very nice experiences and expressions, Time has it with it, but some people also decide to, to go for new shores. And this is to all feeling to some extent a sad thing, but at the same time, it also offers for those persons a, a new opportunity and maybe for Nora, a, a new opportunity for make some new starts, some new ideas on board. And I have to name Philine. Feline did so many years, so good activities and such a good job that it is really hard to, to <laughs> as I say, accept that she decided to move on to other works by end of this year. So we, we honestly have to thank Feline very, very much uh, for everything she did and I, I feel it a bit sad also that, that she is going, but this sadness uh, does not impose any problems on, on Nora work. And I trust also that Feline will not be out of the oyster business at all, but we will meet her in one way or the other. So a farewell, so to say, Feline, and hope to see you very, very soon again, hopefully possibly at the next NORA conference.
And I heard that by end of this year, also Bose at least will uh, step down a little more from the immense work he did for the Secretariat Service uh, and, and works within Nora. So it is also to Bose that we want to thank him so much for all these many years that he supported the just the running of the business together with Feline. Without that, we wouldn't have been such uh, uh, in a such successful uh, situation as we are right now. With Bose, I understand that he definitely will stay uh, with us in, in, in the whole community and also with his wealth of knowledge from international oyster restoration activities. So thanks, special thanks also to Bose. Another person also decided a while ago that, that her workload was too overwhelming. Uh, so she had to leave the advisory board and that is Cass Bromley. So thanks go also to Cass for, for all the work she, she did over the years in the advisory board. With this, I would like to move again to my, and you may take away this, uh, no, sorry, sorry. Of course, at the, at the end of the slide, you saw also those people and, and organizations who contributed so far financially to the running of business of NORA. And uh, I, I thank again those institutions for their generosity towards or NORA work. So let me pick up this last point again. I honestly would like to repeat the call for support support personally by you. If you want to join in, please let us know. But also financially, we need money to run the business. And please, those who are hesitant, still think it over. A contribution of some thousands of euro may be also helpful. And um, this is what we in, in future will really need to, to run the secretariat business. And in that context, if, if one of you finds it fantastic to handle with money, which is not there sometimes, and structure applications for more money or European funds, which are sometimes millions we could apply for, if such a person is with us, please let us know if you want to get engaged in the Nora work and in the advisory board, we definitely need someone like you here uh, that is able to, to draft proposals together with others, but we usually need one driving person for that, as it is true for many similar situations. So last but uh, with that, uh, I would like to, to come to an end. I, I definitely keen to look forward already to our next meeting. We sincerely all hope that it will be done under better conditions. A person meeting, an in-person meeting will all of you, I think we all look forward to it. We are desperate for that. Time will tell, but if that may not work, we apparently have found also a mechanism to even stick together close enough to be very productive. And let's keep that spirit. I, I, I really love to work with you. I'd like to stay with your scene. And so I hope to see you again in one or the other way at latest next year in water. Bye-bye from my side. Bye-bye on behalf of the advisory board. And thanks for your presence. Bye-bye.